Lift our hands and lift our voices in the sanctuary today. Won't you stand as we worship and sing together? our hands we lift our hands in the sanctuary we lift our hands to give you the glory we lift our hands to give you the praise Welcome to Versailles Baptist Church this morning. We're so glad you joined us for worship. We're in the midst of a series called The Family Portrait. And our conviction is that God's Word, the Bible, gives us a picture or a portrait of interacting family members. We start off week one with this portrait of Chris and A.J. Jackson of Mary. We talked about the relationship between a husband and a wife and how that relationship is built upon commitment. We shared that a marriage that is a victim of emotions rather than a servant to commitment is one that will unravel the importance of commitment in a marital relationship and how marriage shows the picture of God and the church. Week two, we shared uh, the portrait of Callie and Grace Statzer. We talked about sibling rivalry, some things we can do to help prevent sibling rivalry, and how do we reconcile with a sibling when we have, in fact, created a barrier between one another. Last week, we shared the picture of the Martins, of uh, the picture of children and how they relate to their parents. As we talked about, children honor and obey your parents. And the idea that how do we help children to honor and obey God? By teaching them to honor and obey and submit to the authority of their parents. And this week, we unveil the picture of the England family, Donna and Danny England, and Allison and Sarah England. And this week, as we shared last week, the relationship between child and parent, this week is the relationship between parent and child. How can we go about being the best parents and grandparents possible, investing in the lives of our children and grandchildren? This morning, we're privileged to have with us a very special guest. Michael Marco will be our speaker this morning. Michael and his wife, Haley, have written numerous best-selling books in the areas of adolescence and a parent and a family. Uh, in 2010, he wrote the book of the year for uh, Christian youth, uh, as, and he'll be sharing with us later tonight, both with our adults and with our teens. We look forward, Michael, to having you come share with us a little later in the service. Well, here at Versailles Baptist Church, not only is our sermon series about family, but we believe that the church should be like a family, a place where you're loved, where you're encouraged, where you grow together, uh, where we can do life together. And about every month, we share with you some of our family portraits, the family pictures. Just as in your home, you have a family album that chronicles several events in the life of your family. Well, each month, we share with you some of the events that have been going on in the life of our church family. So if you draw your attention to your, to your screen, here's what's been going on in this church family over the past six weeks.
We worship and we praise Him. Won't you join us as we continue in worship this morning by singing what it talks about in Psalm 130, crying out to the Lord.
morning. Isn't that funny? We're all programmed to do that. It starts off in kindergarten, it starts in church, starts in the school. As a son of, a, uh, of an elementary school teacher who was an elementary teacher for about 18 years, she actually was a school principal, uh, school principal. I know the response and, and I'm trying like a dog, dog that hears the bell, that starts to salivate. I'm programmed, as I'm sure many of you are. Uh, as by, by way of introduction, um, as your pastor said, my wife Haley and I have written a, quite a few books. Um, we have one daughter, which makes it odd to have someone... Um, come and preach on a topic of parenting that has one daughter, right? It's like, what do you know? So I'll just get that out in the open. It's for posterity, on video. What do you know? And the fact of the matter is, uh, I don't know a lot, but I'm learning day by day. Uh, parenting is one of those things that is, uh, it's, an, it's an odd thing in society when you have to take a test to operate a motor vehicle, but you can just show up pregnant and they'll give you the baby and like rush you out uh, sometimes uh, sooner than you'd like to leave the hospital. 
Um, I know for my wife and I, uh, the, the nurses would say, okay, well, you're, you're about recovered. Um, you could, it was a rough pregnancy for my wife. Uh, she went through 40 hours of labor before an emergency C-section. And so she was like, How, what is the last moment that we can check out? It's almost like you know, being on vacation and, and calling down for a late checkout. That's what we wanted. Um, but that aside, um, one of the reasons that parenting is such a passionate topic for me is because over the course of the last almost 12 years now, uh, my wife and I have been writing books and speaking to and ministering to teens and young adults. Um, it seems odd to utter this, but over the past 10 years, we've written over 40 books, about three quarters, the, three quarters of them for teens and young adults. And so when we got pregnant, and I say we generously, when she got pregnant, um, we really started to look at what it was to reverse engineer what we had encountered in well over a decade of counseling teens and young adults. And so um, we started writing and I started speaking and, and doing interviews with people like Family Life Today and, and, and different folks like that. And, and what we found was a message that really resonated. Um, not because it was rooted in experience, uh, because I have very little, although I was the youngest of six kids. I had four older sisters, grew up in an Italian-Irish family, so it was very calm and quiet, no tempers whatsoever. Um, in fact, I have a little bit of kinship with you, with y'all, actually, well, wait, with all y'all. It's a double plural. Um, and that is, um, well, I... I stayed up late last night, <laughs> like a lot of you probably. And I have this kinship because uh, I grew up and my wife grew up in the state of Oregon and the very first football game I ever went to was the University of Oregon Ducks versus the Oregon State Beavers, the hated rivalry that's called the Civil War. And this football game that I attended was right after, um, I. Having been in a family with six kids, we didn't have a lot of money, and so the very first football game I got to, uh, got to go to was right after I graduated from high school, and it was a Civil War game, and I got the tickets, and it was a raining ice storm, freezing rain. It's one of the benefits of living in Oregon and in the fall, and it's the last game of the season, and the game ended in a 0-0 tie. It's referred to now as the toilet bowl um, in the state of Oregon, but the coach of that Oregon team in one of the first years of his coaching career was Rich Brooks. And so I have a little kinship with you all, and I suffered along with you the travesty of injustice that happened in Florida in the swamp last night. And so I actually chose to wear black this morning <laughs> uh, to mourn last night's loss with you. So. Um, what is the purpose of all preamble? Well, the purpose is one of introduction, and it's the purpose to talk to you about what is the purpose of parenting. What is the purpose of parenting? Because if we base our purpose on survival <laughs> of the parent, like a zookeeper, uh, <laughs> trying to feed the lions and I'm going to go in and I'm going to care for the lions and I'm going to care for the tigers and even the monkeys and, you know, they pick up things and throw it and you got a duck and ultimately I care for the animals but, but if there's one creature that's going to exit that cage alive, it's going to be me, okay? That's, if your purpose is survival, you're going to have a different approach to parenting than, say, someone that wants to see there, that wants to live sacrificially and they want their child to have everything they didn't have, etc. But instead of doing kind of a slow reveal to you this morning with this aha moment or a gotcha moment, I'm going to flip things on its head and I'm going to tell you exactly what you're going to hear ahead of time. Okay? So no magic tricks, no uh, homiletical or sermon-esque 
wow moments. I'm really, any poker players? In, no, don't raise your hand. <laughs> um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to lay my cards out on the table. That's what that means. I'm going to show you my cards so that you can see if what I'm saying is making sense or not, especially since I'm so inexperienced, all right? So what I'm going to submit to you this morning is that parenting, the purpose of parenting is discipleship, okay? For those of you, my wife loves taking notes. I despise taking notes. I, I absorb more if I just listen and watch than if I'm writing, but for, for a lot of you, writing helps. So the purpose of parenting is discipleship. That's my, that's my theorem or my hypothesis that I'm going to try and prove to you this morning. Um, secondly, I'm scanning the back wall for a clock. All right, I'll use one down here. Otherwise, I'll go all night. Actually, I, I can't go all night. I'm speaking tonight back here at 6. So the purpose of parenting is discipleship. And yes, I'm a little ADD. Secondly, what we define as discipleship or what we think discipleship looks like tends to be wrong. And that is, how do we discern or tell what a disciple looks like? And that is by their fruit, by if they're fruitful. So that's the second point. And then the third point is that if the purpose of parenting is discipleship, and discipleship, a disciple bears fruit. The third conclusion is this that a child cannot be what they cannot see. A child cannot be what they cannot see. So what I do now is read, from you, uh, read for you from uh, what I believe are the most, uh, most important parenting verses in the Old Testament. And that's found in Deuteronomy chapter 6. And starting with verse 4, it reads this, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. And these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children and shall talk of them when you sit in the house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. Deuteronomy chapter 6. So, here's the thing. In Western culture, where we live, we love professionalizing things. We love professionalizing things. So, if we have a leaky pipe, who do we call? Plumber, yeah. I invite participation, it's okay. Uh, if we have a problem with our lights, we call an electrician. If we have a problem with a, a sick or dying tree in our backyard, we, tr we call the tree guy. If we need the septic tank pump, you get the picture. Well, when it comes to discipling our kids, we tend to say, well, I'll take them to church and I'll give them to the children's minister or the youth minister and just pick them up and hand them to Kevin and say, here, fix them, right? Or make them see Jesus. Or sometimes realistically, keep them off of drugs and keep them from getting pregnant or getting somebody else pregnant. That tends to be our view of discipleship to kids. Tends to be. Not across the board, but it tends to be. But here's the, here's, the, here's the problem with our professionalizing of society. When we can hire anybody to do anything at any time. When we start to view discipleship as something that we can farm out as parents. What we start to do is we start to live the lie of that I'm not discipling my kids. They're doing it. And here's the, real, the realistic truth. No matter what you believe about discipleship, this is true. 
that you are discipling your kids. If you have toddlers, if you have elementary school students in your home, if you have middle school, high school, if, you have, if you're empty nesters and you have grown kids, the way you interact with them and the way you live your life, even with no regard to them, whatever you're doing, however you're living your life, you are discipling your kids. Because Jesus and his disciples, Jesus didn't farm out discipleship to those men, right? He didn't give them things to read and homework assignments. They copied, they became imitators of Christ. So whether you like it or not, whether you open your Bible or not, whether you fall to your knees with any regularity in prayer, <laughs> or not, you are discipling your kids. Now, discipleship is a scary word to parents because we like to professionalize and we might not, we might, we might feel comfortable reminding our children daily about personal hygiene, but we don't necessarily remind them every day about did they read their Bible, did they pray? Did they do practice not physical hygiene disciplines, but did they practice spiritual disciplines? But let's first, now that I've kind of laid my cards out on the table and I've proposed to you that parenting is discipleship, let me just address maybe the elephant in the room for some of you saying, well, but if parenting is discipleship, what about all of us adults and we have a minister to adults and we have Sunday school or life groups or, or community groups, whatever you might call it here in your congregation. Well, what is that? Could I submit to you today that discipleship as the church knows it is really just a form of reparenting. Discipleship for adults in the church, in our church context, is really a form of reparenting. We're, lear- we're relearning or learning for the first time because our didn't tell us this or teach us this. We're learning who God is and who we are with and without him. Because that's what discipleship is, is learning who God is and learning who we are with and without him. So all of you that are in discipleship classes right now, what you're really learning is you're learning who you are as a child of God, right? We throw that, that, that phrase around a lot. So for you that, in that have, uh, have children still in the home, submit to you, and I've used this phrase three times now, so it's on the shelf. I want it again. Once again, I think, think out loud, so I apologize. This is maybe one teacher as well. Um, pull in the Say what we think. Um, So, so here is, and I lost my train of thought. That's why it's a danger to have an ADD guy. The, the fact of the matter is when we look at parenting, we have children in the home, do you want to hand your children off to the church of their adulthood? They long from your home. Do you want to hand them off where the church basically is to bull? those, the foundation and the house that you've built, the house I bullshit in their home. You want to have, have to hand them off to be reparent or do you want future church or future disciples to be able to build upon the solid foundation that you've laid? Okay. So that's, that's the basis of this morning is that parenting is discipleship. But what, what do we normally do in place of that? If that's not what's happening in our families and in our churches, which I believe it's not. It's not happening in the majority of our families and the majority of our churches. Parents aren't discipling their kids. So what's happening? What, what is replacing this sort of parenting as discipleship mode or method? Well, I think that there's two 
false gospels that we have adopted, especially in America. And the first is the humanistic gospel of parenting. The humanistic gospel of parenting says that the goal, the purpose of parenting is to raise well-mannered, well-behaved, good citizen, or maybe even patriotic, uh, with an emphasis on uh, good citizenship, with an emphasis on patriotism, good, quote-unquote, good kids that are good contributing members to society. That's the humanistic gospel of parenting. Now, why is that humanistic instead of centered around the gospel of Jesus Christ? Well, it's because it's, it's basically a performance-based view of parenting. If my child performs to this level, then that, then my job is done. And this comes into, if they're not robbing people, if they're not breaking the law, if they're courteous, if, oh, such a, a good child, then on our job. But the Apostle Paul refers to all of his accomplishments and all of his law keeping and his humanistic and even ultra uh, religious accomplishments, he refer, refers to them as filthy rags. Because all of the good manners in the world, all of the I voted the right way, I, 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 I tied the right way, I, I do all the things all of this for the good child that grow good adult. None of that will save you. None of that will save you. Now, things, but those that end for our parenting, what guess what parent we're going to evolve into? We're going to evolve into to the graceless parent. The Bible says that there is no one righteous, not one. When we, the humanistic gospel even uh, comes out in words like this, um, nod with me if you ever heard, don't raise your hand, but nod with me if you've ever heard this as a child or you've ever uttered these words, because I, I heard them growing up, do as I say, not as I do. The humanistic gospel that says there's a performance standard on you not necessarily me, but I'm not parenting me, I'm parenting That's a false gospel. It's a false purpose of parenting. A second false gospel or purpose of parenting is the prosperity gospel of parenting. The prosperity gospel. Now, some of you are picturing some of these TV evangelists and... Uh, I won't drop names because some of you might have a, a sweet aunt or, or a family member that, that just watches these people regularly on Sunday instead of showing up here. But, and your prosperous parent doesn't make sense. How many times have you ever uttered this as a Well, I just want them to have everything I didn't have. Or the reverse. I just don't want them to suffer the way I suffered. I don't want them to make the same mistakes that I've made. What this purpose in parenting evolves into, literally, an evolutionary view of parenting. That if I'm, that if I'm a frog, I want my children to be able to jump higher and have a longer tongue to snatch flies than I had. If I'm a cheetah, I want my child to run faster than I could, ever could. Well, eventually. Like, I want to be able to catch them up to a certain point. But then it's an evolutionary kind of view of parenting that if my child doesn't have to suffer through these things, or if my child gets all of the benefits of life that I didn't have, then I've done my job. But look at what Scripture says in James chapter 1, verses 2 through 4. Count it all joy, my brothers. There's that familial phrasing. Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. For now you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. And let steadfastness have its full effect. 
that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. The Bible is very clear that God does for you to have your life now. Your life is to be glory, heaven, when we're reunited with him. When we look at our children and see and, and them as ours, our, our children, and we want to live vicariously through them to have them throw for more yards than before and make it into a game when, when we don't even make it off the bench. That way. Or we view our children as, I want to rescue them from every impending doom or possible disappointment or aspect of suffering. What we're really doing is we're saying to God, God, you can't use suffering in my child's life for their good. You're saying, God, my life and, and the things that I didn't accomplish, my life has less value than people that accomplished things that I wanted to accomplish. That's what you're saying. So you're saying to God that the purpose of life point then well, it's been useless that he's wasted your life. Or maybe you're not blaming it on him and you're just saying, well, I've wasted my life and I don't, want, I don't want my son to waste my life. I don't want my daughter to waste her life. But ultimately, what happens is we start rescuing our child or promoting things in our child's life, giving primacy to things in our child's life helping our children build worship patterns towards things in their lives that aren't God. Another verse, a couple of verses from Romans chapter 5 on this breakdown of this, this false gospel of prosperity and parenting. Romans chapter 5, verses 3 and 5 say this, not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces something. It produces endurance, and endurance produces something. It produces character, and character produces something. It produces hope, and hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. So, the purpose of parenting I'm suggesting to you, I'm strongly suggesting to you, I'm, I'm imploring you to look at scripture and test me on this. The purpose of parenting is discipleship. According to Deuteronomy 6, when you wake in the morning, when you walk along the way, when you lay your head down at night, that is parenting. Your youth minister can't do that. Your Christian school educators can't do that. If we take all the hours on 58 hours a week, 106 hours in the week, if you put your children to one hour a week, that's one one hundred and six eighth of their week. If they're hearing of God, if they're wrestling with the things of faith, one hour a week, and they're not with you, you with little things more than the drive to and from church. And we all know that the drive to church is usually arguing or bickering or whatever. And then as the doors open, it's like, oh, hi. <laughs> right? I'm going to address that a little bit tonight. But one 168th of the week, or if you like percentages, We're really talking about one percent, less than one percent of their week. Thirty of your child's and your children's weeks are in the school, public school, school or private school. Percent, or no, sorry, sixteen uh, percent. Eighty-three 
of time is under purview of us. 83%. So that's why I say, if you don't think you're discipling your kids in who worship or to worship, what you put first, what you give primacy in your lives, you're, you're fooling yourself. Or someone else, much darker, in the spiritual realm, is fooling you. 83% of the time, and you say, well, they're, they're, they're at this or at, the, at that, they're at school. Or, well, that's, that's including sleep time. How many of you, and sometimes when I'm really being a not nice person, this is, this is the after effect of being the youngest of six kids and having four older sisters. I, I tend to tease and torture my wife a lot. And so when I'm, when I'm being unkind, uh, when, when I have that, that little devil on my shoulder, all I have to do to get under her skin is start kind of humming or singing the same song over and over right before bedtime. And whatever I'm doing right before bedtime, this song, like if it's an annoying song, or once again, I, I've got a daughter that loves doing the same thing. Unfortunately for her mother, she takes after me in this way. My wife is complaining in the morning that that song's still in her head, and it was in her head all night, and she couldn't get it out of her head. And she's like, why do you do that to me? Or if we're watching TV, like, like we're in bed and that same commercial gets played over and over, it's in her head. Well, your children, <laughs> you have them 83% of the time. You have purview over them 83% of the time. When you rise in the morning, when you lay down, what are you speaking of? What are you speaking of? Because that's going to be in their heads and in their minds all night long when they, when they lay their head down and when they wake in the morning. So the purpose of the parenting, the purpose of parenting is not a false gospel that the world might pitch to us or that our, human, our sinful human hearts might pitch to us, but ultimately... It's this. It's the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's the words of Christ that should be our purpose of parenting. And the most overlooked parenting verse in the New Testament now, the most overlooked verse in the New Testament that addresses parenting is this. It's Matthew chapter 28, verses 18 through 20. And Jesus came and said to them, all authority in heaven and on earth have been given, has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make what? Disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. If you think about it, what good is the great commission if we're ignoring it in our homes? What good is the Great Commission if we're ignoring it in our homes? And frankly, we're really good in the West of farming out the Great Commission. That's what we have IMB for. <laughs> what we, we give. We, we pay people to go, but this is still a nation. And a nation for us as parents, for, for the men in the room as fathers, your kingdom is not just the easy chair with the separate of the remote control, that is true. You can't get remote control from me. I will not share it. It's a confession and a statement of unrepentant fact. But ultimately, I need to win over my family, Christ. See, in the church, how do we diagnose that a child has surrendered their life to Christ? Well, they probably said something to mom at bedtime, or they said something to their, their Sunday school teacher, and they, they walk down the aisle, and eventually they'll get baptized, and then after that, how do we look at their life and determine if they're a disciple? Honestly, we grade like my favorite college courses. We basically give almost 100% of the grade based on attendance. Are they showing up? That's it. But what Jesus says in the Gospel of John, chapter 15, Jesus defines what a disciple is or how you can identify a disciple. 
John chapter 15. There is no better book and chapter of the Bible to look at discipleship and how you should define and identify who is a Christian and who is not. John chapter 15. And I'm going to start with verse 1 and go to verse 9. And then I'm going to jump to verse 26 for those of you that like the GPS and know what's coming. I am the vine, my father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that does not bear fruit, he prunes, that it may bear more fruit. Real quick sidebar. If you're a tree, you have branches, and someone comes along and prunes your branch, if you're a tree and you have the mind of a human, but you're a tree, does pruning feel good to the tree? To the tree, prosperity is growing big and wide, like the oak and the branches reach higher and and they cover and they create shade. But God's plan and purpose for your life, regardless if you're a parent or not, is that you bear fruit, not that you get big. Society defines success as big Oh, I've heard of you. You've written books. I haven't heard of you. Good. Good. What did John the Baptist say? He must increase and I must decrease. All right, let's keep going. Verse three, already you, already you are clean because of the word I've spoken to you. Abide in me and I in you. Abide is an active imperative. It means constantly remaining in him. It's not you do it once, you walk forward and you're done. Abide and I in you as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. That almost sounds like a team phrase. Hey, hey, kids, kids, kids. I'm the vine, you're the branches. Okay? saying that for us to eat to our church. This is not a command of a thing that is transferred on us. This is for parent and child alike. Parent, you're not the vine. You're not the vine. If you think you bear spiritual fruit, personal life, and go on to your family without abiding in the vine, in the trunk of the organism, you're fooling yourself. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. From apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away like a branch and and the branches are gathered, thrown into the fire and burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, there's a new phraseology there. Earlier he said twice, abide in me and I in you. Now he's being even more specific. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, what are his? You've got to know this. Not for trivial, trivial pursuits we can, double jeopardy. You've got to know this so that you are abiding in Christ so that you are bearing fruit. If you abide in me and my when you ask, you wish to be done for you. Once again, this is not a prosperity, name it, claim verse. This is, if you're abiding Christ, his will becomes will. Wanting what he wants. And you stop wanting what he wants. Because you're attached to him. When you're not attached to him, you want what your heart wants. Follow your heart is the worst advice known to man. Next time you're rereading Genesis and it comes to the picture of the Garden of Eden and the serpent speaks, just replace what the serpent speaks with. Eve, follow your heart. It's about equated. That's a Michael DeMarco translation. It's not actually in most translations, but I'm, I'm giving it to you. By this, verse 8, and here's the money verse. By this, my Father is glorified. Our main purpose on earth, why God creates, was to 
give God glory, to bring glory to God. And so Jesus is saying, this is how you glorify God. This is how you fill your purpose. By this, my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit. And so prove to be my disciples. As my Father loved me, so I loved you in my love. And I'm going forward to verse 26. But when the Helper comes, who's the Helper? The, the Helper is the Holy Spirit. Because Jesus is still walking in physical form. He's not left his Helper, his, the Holy Spirit yet. But when the Helper comes, this is foreshadowing. Whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth who proceeds from the Father, he will bear witness about me. And you also will bear witness. How? Because you have been with me from the beginning. The helper, the Spirit, bears witness to God by helping us bear witness to God. This is my words. And that is through us bearing the fruit of the Spirit in our lives. The fruit of the Spirit. What is the fruit of the Spirit? Galatians chapter 5. There's nine aspects of the fruit of the Spirit. It's not nine fruit. It's not pomegranate and kiwi and lemons and, well, lemons, that'd be a sour fruit of the Spirit. That doesn't make sense. But it's not nine separate fruit. It's nine aspects of the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control. Nine aspects of the Spirit. An orange is what? What color is it? Orange. Okay. Is it sweet or sour? Most of the time sweet. Okay. Is it, uh, is it, is it soft or hard? Is it soft? It's softer than an apple, right? It's soft. Okay. It's fragrant. It's, all of those are aspects of one fruit. If you are abiding in Christ, you will have the fruit of the Spirit in your lives. Do not believe the fruit of the Spirit is like some disc personality assessment or Myers-Briggs personality test where, well, I'm ENJ or I'm an otter or I'm a golden retriever or I'm good at this, but I'm not. I was, I was, I was born kind, but I wasn't really born joyful. Or, well, I'm good at this. No. An orange is an orange. An orange is all these things. So when you have the fruit of the Spirit, when you're abiding in Christ, that means you're loving. That means you're joyful. And yes, that means you have self-control. Does anyone feel like they have mastered and are 24-7 the fruit of the Spirit in their lives? Don't raise your hands because I will tackle you. No, because we can't do it apart from the vine. When we show the fruit of the Spirit in our lives, it's really Christ being shown through us. It's not us. We're not doing it. So what does this all have to do with parenting? Oh, yeah, discipleship. Making disciples, the Great Commission. When you're living a life that is growing the fruit of the Spirit, and this is also a, a tease for my, my time tonight. And I would encourage you, whether you are a parent with children in the home, or you're a grandparent, or you're an empty nester, if you have influence on people that are parents, and or you're concerned about the recent statistics and studies from Barna Research Group and Lifeway Research, that says, depending on which survey that you look at, that 65 to 75% of children that are raised in the church, coming to church, where they have good attendance, 65 to 75% of them, by the time they become the age around college graduation, will leave the church. If you're concerned about that statistic, please come tonight. Because I'm not going to be just talking about parenting uh, advice to change behavior or modify behavior, have a new life ride. I'm talking about what I'm going to be talking about is how we, uh, in, as, our, as families and as a church family and a church congregation, change the side. 
If you're concerned at all about that, you're going to hear a little bit more about this tonight. But once again, I'm a tree and I'm bearing fruit. What good of a tree would I be if I'm not bearing fruit? What, is the, what does the gardener do to the tree that doesn't bear fruit? Cuts it down and then burns it. Okay, how about this? How many of you, when you got married, and I'm going to wrap up with this, how many of you, when you got married, had 1 Corinthians 13 read at your wedding? I did. Okay, a few of you. All right. What's 1 Corinthians chapter 13? It's a chapter on love. Love is pain. It's like the most romantic scripture to have. No, that is the most depressing scripture to have read at a wedding because do you know what that means? Love is patient and kind. It doesn't keep a record of wrongs. I keep a really good record of wrongs. I mean, I do. And See, when we read 1 Corinthians chapter 13 and we're standing, oh, here's the picture right here. We're standing here and when we hear those verses, we're thinking, yeah, that's what I'm going to get. You're going to be patient with me. You're going to be kind. You're gonna... But when the tree, when God in heaven provides the wind and the sun and the rain and, yeah, the fertilizer of life to help us grow, and he prunes us to grow fruit, the fruit is not for the tree to eat. It's ri- ridiculous, Right? The fruit on the tree is not for the tree, but it's for people that God would bring under its branches to eat. Yeah, we might get some windfall, and that's not a check from a long lost uncle. That's the fruit that rots, that doesn't get eaten, and it drops to the ground, and it fertilizes soil. So we get that. God takes care of us as a tree. But if we eat all the fruit in our families and our lives, our kids get nothing. The last quote from that child can't be what she cannot see a child cannot be what she cannot see if you're not growing fruit in your life and if you're not living in a way abiding with Christ that grows fruit the fruit of the spirit in your life how can your child be that and hence we have churches that are reparenting grown adults, reteaching or teaching for the first time who God is and how desperately lost we are without him, but how immeasurably forgiven and how immeasurable his grace is if we would just surrender to him and abide in him. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we call you Father. We are children of you. Your word in Exodus says, honor your father and mother and you will have a long life. But Father, some of us, as grown adult children, are not honoring our fathers and mothers. Honoring our father and mother does not stop Upon high school graduation, Father, we, we confess this. We realize this. We don't want to be fooled. Father, for those of us that have children in the home, help us to turn away from a prosperity gospel of parenting that says that we, we must give them everything that we didn't have or we must keep them from suffering the way that we suffered. Help us to remember the story that your son told of the prodigal son, that there were two sons in that story. Father, help us not to parent like the elder brother who had a humanistic gospel of performance, that if I do everything right and I say everything right, that, that I'm going to get everything that's coming to me and no one else will, will you know, that grace is not something that he just given to me, but I'm going to earn my salvation. I'm going to earn my worth. Help us not to parent in that sort of authoritarian way. But Father, like the prodigal, help us not to 
parent in a hyper permissive way that 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 lets the child run run off and do whatever they want but father help us to speak of your word and speak of your goodness and yes speak of your mercies and grace that you've given us when we've messed up so that our children know that they don't have to, that we're big sinners and little sinners Father, I pray for the children of this congregation, and I pray for us as children of you. I pray that we could more and more become prodigals raising little prodigals, big sinners raising little sinners, always mindful of your forgiveness, and always mindful of creating a house of grace in our homes, not of hyper-permissiveness, but of of branches attached to the vine. Thank you for this time of worship both in singing and in hearing of your word and of giving. In Jesus' name, amen. Jonathan, come. We sing together. Number 451. Good morning, Lord. It's just so uh, wonderful to be in your house on this uh, just beautiful, beautiful uh, Woodford County morning that you have uh, prepared for us, God. We have so much to be thankful for. We are so blessed. And I'm just so thankful to be part of uh, this family here at BBC. I thank you for this uh, series uh, that Michael's prepared for us on just learning how to uh, uh, become better members of our earthly families and of our, our heavenly families. Thank you for Brother Michael DeMarco's words this morning on uh, how to be better parents. Uh, and just this, this nugget of truth, parenting is just disciple and our, our primary purpose. It should be to, to help, our, help our sons and daughters to become like you and to, and to help them uh, find the way that you have prepared for them. And now as we uh, we come this morning to to bring tithes and, and offering, offerings to your store, God, I just pray that each one of us would uh, fully realize the, the, that all good things come from you and all we have we owe to you and that uh, we would just find great, 
great joy this morning in even giving back just a, a portion. I pray that it would be uh, used for your glory in Jesus' precious name. Amen. couple quick announcements for you. One very, very, very special announcement. Miss Anna White. Do y'all know Miss White? As of last week, she has been teaching Sunday school for how long do you think? 10 years? 20? 30? 70 years. As of last week. And, and she doesn't want the attention. I want to give her attention and honor her service to the Lord. She has done that humbly and still does it. To so thank you, Miss Anna, for serving the Lord, especially through our small group ministry school. Thank, thank you. Also, don't forget about the parenting seminar tonight at 6. There will be something for every age. If you have children, of course, bring them. Uh, between 6 and 7, there's something for every single age. And then uh, Michael DeMarco will be with the youth uh, starting at 7. Also, if you're a first-time guest, if you're any guest, we are so grateful that you are here to worship us. I hope and pray that you feel as you came. And, um, if you're a first-time guest, though, we would like, what does that mean? We would like you to want to get your attention. If you're a first-time guest, uh, we have a gift for you. Go right through these doors to our connections desk. It's straight back. You'll see people standing there. Uh, and we have a gift for you. Also, uh, if you have children we have a little gift for them too if you're a first time guest so great you are visiting with us today our, our children and grandchildren cannot be what they cannot see let's let that sink in our children and grandchildren cannot be what they cannot see let us be encouraged to be those models for our children and grandchildren in their lives 
so that they may be followers of Christ. Michael, thank you so much for sharing with us. Uh, Michael DeMarco is going to be at a table out in the foyer as you leave today. Uh, he's got uh, numerous uh, copies of some of his uh, books available. If you'd like to browse through those, or if you'd like to purchase one of those today, uh, he'll be making his way out there briefly uh, in just a brief moment so you can meet him and encourage him as you do that. And please come back tonight as, as he gets more of kind of the nuts and bolts on how to the, the how-tos of being a, a parent who disciples their kids tonight at 6 o'clock. And, and if you have a teenager, if you know of a teenager, encourage them to be here at the student ministry tonight as uh, Michael will be sharing a bit about relationships among teens, especially in the realm of dating. Look forward to that. Well, it's been an exciting time all around the office in the past uh, little bit with our staff. Uh, lots of celebrations around. Uh, Kevin, I think he's up in the zone area. Is that right? Is yeah, Kevin's up in the zone area this morning, but they recently closed and moved in on a uh, their new house, and uh, I heard that they had already unpacked, which is a huge celebration, and have a contract on their house in Bowling Green, so that's a big praise uh, in their lives. Um, recently, uh, Johnny and a colleague were commissioned by the governor of Kentucky to write a celebration on their anniversary, and that celebration this Saturday, and his colleague orchestrated that and this week um, Jonathan and Reagan Berry will be going on a very special trip uh, they were chosen recently by Senator Mitch McConnell to be our representative from the state of Kentucky to the congressional uh, adoption uh, ceremony the angels of adoption as each state gets to send representatives to be part of that celebration and they're going to be our ambassadors not just from Versailles Baptist Church but ambassadors from the state of Kentucky uh, as they get the chance to go to Washington, D.C. this weekend, this week, as the senator's guest. And so, so we just celebrate. And I'm happy to have this great guy working on the team. Celebrations uh, all around. <laughs> Next week, be sure to come back and join us. We're talking about location. I'm really looking forward to drag Drag your wives, wives, drag your husband. You need to be here next week. Communication within me. We look forward to this next week. We close out.